Companion planting. Is it true or is it just a myth? Many people believe the stories they read about companion planting, but are they true? Is there scientific evidence to support the recommendations? In this program, I'll have a closer look at this complex topic. I know some of you just want a simple answer, so here it is. There are some cases of companion planting that are valid, but most of the claims are not. The books on the subject are mostly fiction. The reports online are not usually based on any kind of evidence, and some of the claims can actually increase the harm to your plant from things like pests. Does companion planting work? If I plant corn and climbing beans together, the corn provides structure for the beans to climb up, and that is good for the beans. This example is quite clear, and it seems to demonstrate that companion planting works. Lettuce likes to grow cool, and by midsummer, it needs extra shade to stay cool or it bolts. Planting it behind a large tomato plant provides a cooler environment. Again, this seems like a good example of companion planting. It is kind of pointless to have a debate about whether or not companion planting works. I just gave you two examples to show it does work in at least two cases. The problem is that just because it works in these two cases does not mean that the hundreds of other examples also work. For example, Planting marigolds to reduce root knot nematodes is a very common suggestion. It does work, provided you match the right species of marigold with your nematode problem, and you first grow the marigold, and then in the same season, immediately follow it with the crop. This is something that is only possible in warm climates, and for this reason, it doesn't work for most gardeners. The only intelligent way to discuss companion planting is to consider each example on its own merit. If I did that, it would take me weeks to finish this program. Instead, I will look at some more general concepts and then have a look at some specific cases in other programs. Let's first have a look at what science says. Most of the examples of companion planting promoted by gardeners have not been tested. The reality is that research money is tight, and when it is available, it's going to be used for agricultural situations, not home gardens. Most suggestions have no scientific basis. Many times it is just stuff people made up to sell advertising, sell a book, or promote an individual's idea. I had a look at a book that popularized this topic called Carrots Love Tomatoes by Louise Riot. It contains absolutely no scientific information for any of its claims. Most combinations don't even have a logical explanation as to how they might work. The readers expect it to just believe, and many do, and that has resulted in the claim being repeated millions of times as if they are fact. Let's get to the basics. What is companion planting? I borrowed a couple books on companion planting from the library to see what other authors are saying. I won't mention the titles because neither one of them was worth reading. They covered such topics as composting, plant diversity, soil improvement, square foot gardening, vermicomposting, green manures, gardening by the moon. Uh, you get the idea. Anything that is remotely connected to organic gardening seems to qualify as companion planting, according to some authors. But that is not correct. The books I just mentioned had almost nothing in them about real companion planting. And that's one of the problems with this topic. There is no single accepted definition. If we can't agree on what it is, how can we debate its existence? I've taken a definition from the North American Permaculture Magazine and modified it to include the case where only one plant receives a benefit. Companion planting is a type of polyculture where two or more plant types are grown together because at least one of them shows improved growth due to the presence of the other. The key points in this definition are, one, two or more types of plants are grown together, and two, at least one plant grows better because of its neighbors. This definition narrows the scope and excludes things like growing a cover crop for a better future yield or intercropping to maximize the use of space and the use of raised beds. It simply looks at two actual plants growing together. We also have the concept of good companions and bad companions. 
Apparently, some plants prevent others from growing properly. Walnuts and tomatoes are the classic examples of this. Tomatoes don't grow under walnut trees, or so they say. Fennel does not seem to get along with anything, except dill. Who knew? The above definition talks about the good companions with no mention of the bad. None of the definitions I looked at included the bad one. But everyone goes on to discuss them as if they are part of the topic. I like the terms good companions and bad companions, as in good bugs and bad bugs. There's very little scientific evidence supporting the idea of bad companions. Some people talk about allelopathy. That is the technical term used to describe how walnuts prevent plants from growing. But most of the support for this is demonstrated in the lab and not in the field. There are other kinds of bad. For example, some plants are hogs when it comes to nutrient and water reserves. Think of the soil around the eastern white cedars, also called arborvitae. I think they would be bad companions for just about any plant because the soil under them is so dry. How does companion planting relate to organic gardening? It seems that many authors combine these two topics as if one is dependent on the other. Or maybe it is that organic gardeners are just more likely to believe all of the hype around companion planting. One thing is clear, the two topics are not connected since you can practice one without the other. You can garden organically and not use or believe in companion planting and vice versa. What are the benefits of companion planting? There are numerous ways in which one plant may benefit the other, and I'll describe a number of these. The examples I'm going to give are provided to illustrate the concept. I'm not suggesting that any of them actually have scientific support for being true. So here's one benefit. Some plants provide physical protection or support. A large shrub provides wind protection, which might allow a tall delphinium to flower without the flower spike being broken by the wind. The corn provides physical support for the bean to climb, as does the shrub with clematis growing up it. Another benefit is the use of trap crops. One plant is used to attract a pest, which in turn leaves the other plant alone. Japanese beetles prefer corkscrew hazel over roses, at least in my garden. My roses were hardly ever attacked by Japanese beetles until my corkscrew died. I also grew a strange little plant called Desmodium canadense. Its common name is the showy tick trefoil. This was a Japanese beetle magnet. It would have hundreds of beetles on it, and yet the plants all around had none. Now we can agree that certain plants do attract specific insects more than others, but will placing such plants next to other plants protect them? Or do they attract more pests to your garden and the real benefit are your neighbor's garden. This is the case with commercial Japanese beetle traps. They work because they attract and capture the beetle. But in a normal sized garden, they bring in more beetles than they capture. I wouldn't use them myself, but I do recommend them to my neighbors. Another way companion planting works is by modifying the environment. So plant A can modify the environment for plant B. The lettuce and tomato are such a combination, since the tomato provides shade for the lettuce. In the three sisters planting, the squash shades the ground so that there are fewer weeds, which is said to benefit the bean and the corn. I don't think anyone questions the fact that plants modify the environment around them. However, however, extrapolating this to conclude that the companion plant grows better is false logic. For example, the tomato has a big root system and may actually slow down the growth of lettuce that's growing at its base. A trellis that provides shade might work much better than a tomato plant. And if that's the case, then the lettuce and tomato are not good companion plants. Companion plants are also claimed to attract beneficials, including pollinators. Now, many flowering plants attract pollinators to the garden, which may then go on and pollinate vegetable crops. A big problem with this approach is that flowering plants also attract pests. Pests also want nectar. So is this a net benefit for the partner plant? Plants can also deter pests. Certain plants will keep pests away. 
So if they are planted next to pest attractive plants, they keep pests away from both plants. For example, it's claimed that aphids and white cabbage butterflies hate the smell of mint and that mint keeps aphids off crops. It is also claimed that mint keeps ants away, but that is a known myth. Some plants make nutrients more available. The classic case here is growing legumes to provide the nitrogen for their partners. This is a very common myth, but the reality is that as long as the legume is growing, it adds very little nitrogen to the soil. There is no benefit to the partner plant. Now, once the legume dies and decomposes, there is some benefit. But that does not meet our definition of a companion planting. Comfrey is commonly called the dynamic accumulator because its deep roots bring nutrients to the surface where other plants can use them. As discussed in my blog, GardenMist.com, this is simply not true. So it begs the question, are there plant combinations where one partner provides nutrients for the other? Not that I'm aware of. Another benefit of companion planting. One partner suppresses weeds for the other. The claim is that if plant A suppresses weeds, then plant B grows better. This seems to make sense. But if plant A is not also a crop plant, is it just not another weed that you planted? Plant A competes with plant B, just like the weeds. You've just replaced one weed with another. Can a companion plant improve the flavor of its partner? This is also a common claim. Is there a plant that you can grow beside your tomatoes to make them sweeter? Apparently, planting basil and tomatoes together improves the flavor of both. Now, that might be interesting, but given the general biology of plants and their limited ability to absorb complex flavor molecules through the air or soil, I'm really skeptical that this is right. I've looked for scientific evidence of this and can't find any. If a plant grows better because of a good companion, then it might produce more flavor molecules, or maybe it makes more sugar, which would make it sweeter. The cases I've just discussed are some ways in which one plant might help another, and there could be cases where what I've said is quite true. But there are also many other claims for companion planting that are just plain nonsense. Here are some of them. Herbs work especially well as companion plants. They multitask by attracting beneficial insects and repel pest insects. Well, let's have a close look at this claim. Why is it that all herbs have this property? Herbs are defined by how we use them, as in a plant or plant part that is valued for its medicinal, savory, or aromatic qualities. Would insect behavior not be determined by a plant's biology as opposed to how humans use the plant? Why would insects react the same way with all herbs? That makes no sense at all. Any such statement about all herbs is certainly false. How exactly does the herb know which insect is beneficial and which is a pest? Why would its biology be able to attract one and not the other? Seems like more nonsense to me. Here's another claim. Plant valerian, lovage, and dill around any struggling plant to improve its health and vitality. So if I have a plant that is wilting because of lack of water, I can plant dill beside it and my plant will recover. And it also cures mildew. If dill is this effective, it really should be packaged and sold as snake oil. How about this one? On one website, it says nasturtiums are excellent natural pest deterrents. And on a different site, it says nasturtiums are a good trap cropping plant since they are a magnet for aphids. Aphids are certainly a pest. How can one plant both deter aphids and attract them? It has to be one or the other, not both. It's also quite possible that neither is true. It's statements like these that must make you question everything about companion planting. Most articles about companion planting are poorly done and include no explanations or references to support their position. Many just copy the same list over and over again, repeating the same nonsense. Are there real benefits to companion planting? 
Well, let's have a closer look at the definition. Companion planting is a type of polyculture where two or more plant types are grown together because at least one of them shows improved growth due to the presence of the others. A very key point here is improved growth. But what does that really mean? Consider the case of the bean climbing up the corn. Clearly the bean is growing better and is able to get its leaves up higher to catch more sun. One could conclude it has improved growth. Do we care about improved growth or do we want a bigger bean harvest? Corn uses a lot of water and nutrients, so its root system competes with the bean for resources. It also shades the lower leaves of the bean plant. What if the bean plant produces lots of growth but few beans? Is the corn still a good companion? Companion planting in a vegetable garden should really be defined in terms of productivity. Does the plant pairing produce more food than when the plants are grown separately? In an ornamental garden, it makes sense to define improved growth in terms of appearance. More flowers, better leaf color, or less disease. Should you try companion planting? There are certainly some cases where plants benefit from having partners. And there are other cases that are just complete nonsense. It's next to impossible to tell one from the other. One study that looked at several different vegetable crops in garden-sized beds concluded that companion planting can offer advantages over monoculture, but these are not achieved simply by combining certain compatible companion species. Crop density, ratio, and relative planting times all affect the way that companion species interact with one another and their environment. In short, the topic is very complicated. If you hear about a companion planting and the source does not give a plausible explanation as to why the combination works, don't believe it. If it lacks references to scientific studies, it probably doesn't work. Use common sense in the garden and ignore most companion planting information. In future programs, I will look at some specific examples to see if there is enough research to support their use. And I'm happy to report that I have found a few that do work and a few that work only in specific situations. I hope you enjoyed this program and I will do more about companion planting in the future.